Lyra store and listen to us on the go. We're streaming live on Facebook. Our handles 3FM927 as well as on Twitter. Same handles 3FM927. Coming up this afternoon, court activities in limbo as nationwide strike by judicial service staff takes effect. We we'll take you around the country to access day one of industrial action and the implication for justice delivery. We are here to see our supervising high court judge. He even actually instructed us to come yesterday, that uh, we should come to court. But unfortunately, they have denied us access to go and see him. Stay with us for more on this. Also this afternoon, International Monetary Fund proposes immediate reforms of state-owned enterprises following concerns over the fiscal cost of SOEs to the central government. And much later, African countries renew commitment to see through a successful implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement as Ghana and the rest of the African continent marks AU Day. Meanwhile, the President of the Republic has called for urgency and fearless determination to drive the inter africa free trade objectives to promote effective development especially in the agricultural sector we have details of these stories and a lot more if you stay with us for the next 30 minutes A pleasure that you could be a part of this afternoon's bulletin. I am Eric Mawina Egbeta. Let's get into the details now. And court activities across the country are in limbo. A strike by judicial service staff takes full effect. JUSAG on Wednesday declared a nationwide strike over what they described as a failure by government to implement revised condition of service as well as pay arrears due members. The association at a news conference ordered its members to stay home. Here is President of the Judicial Service Staff Association of Ghana speaking. Our salary review was approved by the Judicial Council on 29th March 2023. Same was forwarded to the presidency. We were just waiting for their approval. We've not heard anything. So meaning simply uh, they don't need our support. We hereby declare an indefinite strike. By this declaration of strike, all staff of the service are immediately directed not to report to work from today onwards unless and until the President of Ghana complies with Article 149 of the Constitution by approving and paying our new salaries with all the arrears from January to date. So that's the president of the Judicial Service Workers Union Association of Ghana speaking there. He's Samuel Afote Oto and they addressed the media yesterday. After that, well, individuals in their numbers today who were not aware of the industrial action thrown the court and were left stranded. Some of them have been speaking to 3FM. The issue uh, is that uh, we are the jurors, we are under the, the, the criminal assizes cases mm. at the high courts. Mm. And uh, today we have about six cases to, to handle today. And then when we came, unfortunately, our uh, main gates have been locked by the security guards. And uh, we are here to see our supervising high court judge. He even actually instructed us to come yesterday, that uh, we should come to court. So we wanted to see him and inform him that the jurors has come to perform our duties. That is our duty. That is expected of us to perform as a patriotic and a, a, as a, a Ghanaian and as a, 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 a bureau. So we are here to report to him that we have come to court. But unfortunately, they have denied us access to go and see him. So we are going back to our various offices and uh, actually uh, to work there. So some jurors stranded in the Ashanti region. William Evansinkum is a northern region bureau chief. He's joined us on the telephone line uh, to paint a picture for us as to exactly what the situation is. William, you've been to the court in the uh, Kumasa metropolis. Exactly what is the situation? Well, so almost all the courts that I've visited this morning are deserted. In fact, after quite district court, which is one of the busiest because of the chunk of cases that come there, uh, the place looks almost like a ghost town. I mean, the main entrance to the courtroom, I mean, it was locked with red band 
hang them and an indication that um, no service or an agreed judicial staff or judicial service apparently not working. Pause of cases. Um, um, I mean, that was supposed to be heard today. Um, there was no show. So invariably, we're likely to see a pileup. Then, of course, I visited the law court, which also has um, the circuit court and the magistrate court. The main entrance to the court premises was actually locked. So you wouldn't even have access to the court, let alone uh, know whether there's going to be a hearing of case or otherwise. Then, of course, the appeal court complex was also not different. Even there, the security will not even allow anybody to access the court premises because of the current situation. Marina. And so for individuals who have cases and the likes, we've heard from some jurors, wh what's been their demeanor turning up at the court and finding out that the, well, the, the courts are not working? Very, very, very disappointing, eh? mm. uh, especially one person who wouldn't, want, who wouldn't want to speak to me because of the fact that he finds himself in a very uncomfortable situation, uh, has been told that he was going to have a final determination of his case today only to come there and nobody is ready to right. attend to him. And right. he has to go back to uh, I mean, where he came from. And he told me he was traveling from a very far distance. Uh, and he doesn't even know when the case will be determined because this particular strike, as he was told by one of the aggrieved workers, is an indefinite one. Right. Evans, many thanks uh, for speaking to us. That's William Evans Sinko, my colleague in the Ashanti region. Let's take you to Tamale and see what the situation is there like as well. Christopher Marcos joined us on the telephone lines. Chris, Evans has told us disappointment on the faces of individuals with cases in the court. Is there a similar situation there? Yes, uh, Marina, it is very similar because uh, uh, most of the people who were in court today because their cases were supposed to be heard uh, were disappointed. And in fact, uh, a visit to the Tamale Magistrate Court and the High Court uh, revealed that uh, the Jews uh, staff were not uh, uh, at post because uh, uh, of the strike action. The gates to the various entrants were all uh, branded in red colors, indicating that they are on strike. So the situation is the same here. Right then, Christopher Marco, my colleague there, providing uh, some details as well. But the indication we get is that the Labour Commission, uh, later in the day, will intervene in this particular uh, misunderstanding between the Judicial Service Workers Union and then the government. But let's pick the thoughts of a private legal practitioner. Those who engage the services of these individuals and are always present in court. Vitus Bang is a private legal practitioner. He joins us on the telephone line. Mr. Bang, I appreciate that you could speak to us this afternoon. So for you as lawyers, turning up in court and finding out that the courts are not working, how are you reacting to this? Hello, sir. Unfortunately, it does appear we do not have Vitus Bang on the. Yes, can you hear me, please? Yes, I can hear you. Right, I'm on. Right, yes, you, you can I proceed. Can you. So, thank you and good afternoon to you and your listeners across the country. Um, yes, the, it's quite frustrating uh, for lawyers and other court users to um, turn up in court and to uh, not have the opportunity of working because the judicial service staff workers are on strike. Of course, the judicial service staff play an integral role in the administration of justice. Uh, they are needed in every step of the way. Um, if you want to file any document in court, you will need to uh, get that done by the court clerks. So if they are not present, it means that you cannot file any process. You cannot initiate or institute a new case because uh, the staff of the, I mean, the court are not present. Mm. Uh, you, if you have a case, you are also unable to uh, go on with your case because the uh, critical staff that assist the, I mean, the justice delivery system are clearly absent. So even if the judges are willing to sit and, uh, I mean, on cases, they are unable to do so because these critical staff that assist in the justice administration are absent. So for instance, if a judge even shows up, the chance that he will have access to his court 
or to his, um, let's say, office or chamber, it's very unlikely that such a, an opportunity will be afforded the judge. So it, it essentially keeps everything uh, at bay. I mean, new processes can uh, be filed, new courts can sit, because these uh, judicial service staff, they are very integral in the justice administration process. So, mm. yes, to conclude, it is frustrating. And it only means that a, a lot more cases will be delayed. For instance, in the case that's, was that's, extra, be, that's extra cost uh, for... Yes, yes that, that comes with extra cost, of mm. course. And uh, for instance, if a case was to be heard today and the courts are not open at all, then it means that the parties in court may not even get the, the opportunity of being given a new date to, to reappear right. or a uh, date for adjournment. They right. will not get that. So it means that uh, another process will have to be initiated when the uh, judicial service staff resume work mm. and for hearing notices to be issued to the relevant parties. And all of this comes at a cost and also would further um, delay the uh, justice dispensation process. Right. So all of these are things that are reasonably expected to happen. Mm. Counsel, just hold on briefly for us as we touch on just another story. So, uh, Justice Jones Doche, he's assumed the role of acting Chief Justice following the retirement of Justice Kwesi Ninyebua, who served as a judge for 21 years, and that transition uh, took place yesterday. Quick thoughts on uh, the now-retired Chief Justice Kwesi Ninyebua and his contribution to uh, the third arm of government. All right, thanks again. Uh, well... Chief Justice uh, Richard Kesi Enyebua has uh, done his best, I believe. Um, of course, his uh, regime or era was uh, met with so many challenges. Uh, I mean, uh, dwindling trust in the judicial, I mean, in the administration of justice and a uh, number of issues that came up and people were probably expecting mm. him to be very decisive and deal with them um, in a manner that was desired, but never happened. All the same, there were some positives. Right. Of course, um, in the infrastructure side, a lot of new courts were established during mm. the period. Um, a lot of uh, judges were also appointed to fill most of those uh, new places that have been created. So, um, well, he did his best. But it is, I believe that uh, he'll be quite unhappy, unhappy to retire only yesterday, and then at the time that the Judicial Service Workers Union were on strike. Right. Uh, I, I don't know how he'll be feeling. Uh, with the new, I mean, acting Chief Justice and a new Chief Justice to come, uh, and you only come and meet this uh, labor front being divided with uh, this, this uh, strike and what have you, it means that it's going to take some time for the new Chief Justice if uh, she's finally... Um, approved and she assumes office it's going to take some time for her to settle in but i believe that right. the justice administration process is uh, quite well built and with time all these issues will be resolved and the judicial service workers union will go back to work Right then, uh, counsel, I appreciate that you could speak to us. That's Vitus Bank. He's a private legal practitioner and a law lecturer as well, speaking to us on two issues. First, the strike by the Judicial Services Workers Association of Ghana, and then uh, the retirement of Chief Justice Kwesi Enin Iyeboa. We'll move away from this talk matters of the economy now because the International Monetary Fund has called for reforms of state-owned enterprises to reduce their reliance on government subvention. The IMF, in its assessment report on Ghana, expressed concern that SOEs are imposing a direct fiscal cost to government and a major source of fiscal risk. This, they say soundly reflect both weak institutional arrangement and unsustainable sectorial policies. My colleague Grace Hamachiman, she's been going through uh, that 127 plus report of the IMF has joined us in studio with details on the state-owned enterprises. Grace, what does it say? So, Moana, the IMF is particular about two, that is the energy sector, enterprises in the energy sector mm. as well as um, enterprises in the cocoa sector, specifically cocoa board. And IMF says that the energy sector for some time now has been 
recording shortfalls due to distribution losses, issues with their take-or-pay contract, um, costing government some 2% of GDP, and then other debt to IPPs. When it goes to the cocoa sector, it says the cocoa sector, cocoa board, has been recording annual losses for many years, and the reasons are high rollover of outstanding cocoa bills, um, high purchasing prices, other interventions like fertilizer supply, and then cocoa roads and other administrative expenses. IMF is very particular about the construction of cocoa roads, and they say, yes, this is good because um, the roads are in some areas where cocoa is produced, but they think governments can have a real look at these cocoa roads. Right. So um, they are, they've put in place or recommended a, number a, of lot, solutions. a, lot, of, a lot of recommendations government needs to do, mm. and most of them will have to be done by June um, that is next month, mm. especially in the energy sector. IMF wants um, government to um, come up with a new strategy that will update our energy sector recovery plan. And that has to be done by the end of June next month. IMF also wants a review of arrangement to foster competition and efficiency in the energy sector. They want audited SOEs to submit their financial statements to the IMF in a timely manner for um, recommendations and then the way forward. They also want SIGA to, co to collaborate with IMF to ensure efficiency in the energy sector. When it comes to the cocoa sector, um, they want a legal binding framework for um, realistic PPI right. so that we don't just get up and say, let's peg the PPI at this. They want a realistic framework on the PPI. They also want government to cut down on administrative expenses and other quiz activities coming back again to the construction of Cocoa roots. Right then, Grace Hamachim and my colleague there providing a lot more details on what the IMF requires of us. But the president says he finds no problems with the involvement of China in the Ghanaian economy. His comment comes after an IMF report on Ghana for the 2023 fiscal year. Said China may take control of the country's natural resources and electricity revenues following Ghana's inability to pay some 1.9 billion US dollars in debt. But speaking at the Qatar Economic Forum in Doha, President Tukufoda says China's investment in Ghana has been beneficial. China is the biggest bilateral predator to Ghana. What were discussions like with them? I mean, well, did they contribute well, to part of the delay? Yes, no, no. I think that China, China took a very uh, positive, proactive role. They co-chaired the official creditor committee. It was the final hurdle that we had to overcome before being able to go to the fund. It was where that's President Kufaro speaking there, and Ghana has been a major recipient of Chinese loans since 2000. In two decades, the country has borrowed close to $5 billion from China for major projects such as roads, bridges, and power plants, and these loans have helped Ghana to improve its infrastructure and boost its economy. We'll move away from this now, and food supply under the Free Senior High School Program has come under threat as suppliers give government and the National Food Buffer Stock Company two weeks to release funds to them. The suppliers who gave government the two-week ultimatum say they haven't received payment since May 2022. Kweku Amedume speaks for the over 270 suppliers. We have lost credibility in the eyes of our creditors, farmers and bankers, who are resorting to all manner of activities against our members, all in the bid to recoup their money we owe them. The banks are on our necks to take over our properties and assets because we are in default of the loan agreement we have had with them. We are by this press conference serving notice to the National Food Buffer Stock Company that failure to pay us in 14 days from now, all the areas owe our members, we will resort to picketing in the premises of the National Food Buffer Stock Company. Yes. Yeah. That's Kweku Amedume. He speaks for the over 270 suppliers. Let's speak to the deputy ranking on the Education Committee of Parliament, Dr. Clement Park, for some more on this talk. I appreciate that you could speak to us first. It was school feeding caterers. Now these suppliers are also threatening to pull back should government not honor them in terms of funds owed them. One too many, you'd say, in the education sector. Well, first of all, let me say good afternoon to you and to good afternoon to our, our listeners. 
and to indicate that this is a very unfortunate uh, development. And I'm glad you made a reference to the fact that the school feeding caterers, and uh, these are caterers who have been engaged by the state through government to provide one nutritious hot meal per day for our wards in the primary school. They have been on strike now in excess of uh, four weeks for two main reasons. One is that they are old areas for work done, and two is that the current rate of 97 pesos per child per day is woefully inadequate given the current economic situations for them to be able to prepare a nutritious hot meal per day to feed our wolves. Now, it looks like we are beginning to see a situation where uh, those who are also supplying food as contracted by government through the Ghana uh, Food Buffer Stock Company to supply food items to our secondary schools are also indicating that they would go on strike, or if you like, they would stop providing food to secondary schools. Mm. Uh, I've had the time to listen to their grievances, and they make the case that as per the contractual agreement between them and government through the uh, food buffer stock company, they are supposed to be paid 60 days. 60 days after they have supplied food items to secondary schools. They say it's in excess of a year and a half, but they say it is one year, eight months, the last time that they were paid. And they indicate that this is giving them a lot of challenges and has rendered them to be not credit worthy as far as their suppliers are concerned. So they are therefore giving government an ultimatum. Mm. That if government fails to pay them in 14 days, beginning yesterday, they were going to start picketing. And I think that should be a wake-up call for government. And I fail to understand why, in spite of the colossal amount of resources that government has allocated to finance the fish school policy, government will lose buffer stock food supply. Well, we know that over... 70% of the cost of financing the fish and school policy is to do with supplying food. So if government tells mm. us that it has invested or at least has allocated from 2017 to 2023, uh, based on the budgetary allocations, uh, just about 12 billion, 12 billion Ghana cities. And in five years, government says that it has expended anywhere between 5.1 to 5.3 billion dollars series, depending on whether it is the Minister for Education speaking or the Finance Minister speaking. Why is it that government will lose the buffer stock right. food suppliers right. as much as they do? So we would be calling on government to do the needful and to pay them so that we don't have a situation where already existing challenges to do with inadequate and erratic supply of food is now going to exacerbate to a total lack of food to feed our wards in the secondary school system. Dr. Clement Park, I appreciate that you could speak to us. He's a deputy ranking member on the Education Committee of Parliament, uh, bringing his thoughts to what is yet another worrying challenge for the country's education front with the buffer stock threatening to pull out should government not honor them in some monies paid to them. Now, the amendment of the Civil Service Act 1993 is at the cabinet stage to, among other things, include a performance contract for directors of the civil service. A civil service law was passed to replace the Civil Service Act to govern the operations of the local government. There's a lot more in this news desk report. The Civil Service Law 1993 PNDC Law 327 was passed to replace the Civil Service Act 1960 to govern the operations of the local government system. The new law, Act 327, makes provision for performance assessment, sexual harassment, appointments and promotions guidelines, and scheme of service frameworks. Performance management. 
has become a very solid part of the thing. It's really not in the law. It's mentioned in cash workers. Now we want to really put to make it a solid part of it. We want to have a system where people will not come to office and say that they can just come and sit down and go. So we have what we call senior civil service. Maybe directors, coordinating that as a chief director. We've put that in the law as a category. And we have been looking at the possibility of saying, these guys will be there. You are career civil servant. But if you want to be in that, you come on contract. Sometimes there's that if you don't perform, then at the end of the period, you go home. The civil service has over the years been faced with challenges in terms of logistics. This has often resulted in so much paperwork affecting productivity. Nana Ajekun Jamina says the service is automating to prevent red tapism and wastages. Once you start automating things, it makes a lot of work easier. And when you re-engineer the process, and you can go to the officer right, by the time that five days is up, we have results already. So business re-engineering. So that's what we mean by wasting. We're reducing those. So it's not the step, not the bureaucracy, but we are already areas where we think we can improve upon. The Civil Service Week, which begins on Wednesday, May 25, will end with a performance awards on Friday, June 2, and other activities, including a policy fair and a public lecture. That was a news desk report and today is African Union Day. The president has called for a sense of urgency and fearless determination to drive the intra-Africa free trade objectives to promote effective development, especially in the agricultural sector. Now, opening the 7th Africa Leadership Forum here in Accra, the president encouraged leaders to unlock Africa's agricultural potential by working collectively to add value to the continent agricultural produce and he's not the only one who's been speaking in relation to that because the countries on the continent they've renewed their commitment to see through a successful implementation of the african continental free trade agreement the conclusion was arrived at when uh, the country or ghana hosted the rest of the continent to mark the 60th au day celebration at the forecourt of the state house here in the capital. You're listening to the news here on 3FM 92.7. We're streaming live on Facebook as well. Same handles 3FM 927 as well as on Twitter. Same handles 3FM 927. And let's end with the head of immigration service. Uh, they are calling on ECOWAS members and are pushing for the creation of an ECO visa that will ensure third country nationals are given easy access into ECOWAS member states. This, according to them, will help promote investment in member countries. And we'll end with the board chair of the Ghana National Petroleum Corporation, Freddie Blay, because he's denied selling GNPC assets while admitting that the transaction with Petro SA is completed. He explains that there's no block they are selling but a 7% share in Jubilee Oil Limited that Petro SA was fighting over and wanted to go into arbitration. But he, Freddie Blay, rather proposed a 50-50 share. He's also been denying any friction between himself and the Minister of Energy, Matthew Pukuprempe, while admitting that the minister is aware of the transaction from the onset. There'll be a lot more on this for you if you stay with us here on 3FM 92.7, but it's time for us to make way for the business team to bring us the very latest from the world of business. And hey, Kia Mensa Brampa, she's on standby with the very latest in the world of business. I am Eric Mawina Egbeta, as always. A lot more news if you log on to 3news.com. Have a good afternoon.